Hi folks, welcome back to the Tabletop's Edge and our second video in the Discovering the Second World War series. Before we dive into a scenario proper, I thought I would do a short video, probably a very short video, going over the sequence of play and showing you the units in the game. And we'll take a look at the land, air, and sea units, explain what the factors on the counters mean so that when we do get into the scenario playthroughs, you'll have some idea of what it is you're looking at. I also wanted to take the opportunity to give you a sneak peek at the maps for Hakapella. And what you see here is, in fact, the entire map footprint for the game. So there are three maps here of varying sizes, and the map coverage ranges all the way from northern Germany and northern Poland here up through the Baltic states over to uh, Leningrad. You've got all of Finland, all of Sweden, a big chunk of Norway as well. And the reason, uh, it's a little, maybe a little surprising to see the maps go that far west for a game on the Winter War, but several of the scenarios in Hakapella are hypothetical scenarios uh, positing a German invasion of a neutral Sweden in 1941, I think 42 and 43. So included in the game is the entire Swedish order of battle for the uh, for the entire war, and uh, actually there are more Swedish counters in Hakapella than there are Finnish units and Soviet units. So uh, just wanted to give you a brief glance at that. Uh, we will be seeing more of Hakapella uh, in greater detail later on in the series, but I thought it would be a nice counterpoint to Singapore that we looked at earlier. And uh, just to let you know, there are a few games in this series that are much more manageable in terms of uh, map footprint and uh, numbers of units than, uh, than others. They're not all gigantic monsters like Singapore, Barbarossa, or Mare Nostrum. So let's go ahead and take a look at the sequence of play to get a little better understanding of how the turns in this series flow. Just a couple of quick comments on the charts that are included in the games in the series. What you see in front of you are the charts on the right from Singapore, and on the left are the charts from Hakapella. Now, Singapore was published back in 2015, and the rules version at that time was version 1.4. My edition of Hakapella is from 2021. I think it's a second printing. It's not a full second edition necessarily, uh, but I believe they went through and corrected some errata. Uh, but with 2021, Barbarossa also was released last year in 2021. The current rules are version 1.6. So a few modifications from the Singapore rules, but from my understanding, it's mostly uh, cleaning up of, of typos, no major uh, changes to the mechanisms in the game. And the first thing that jumps out at you from these charts is that the Singapore charts are bound, and they do have this, or this uh, ring binding on them, which at first glance you think, oh, well, that's nice. It keeps the charts nice and organized in the box. That'll be real handy. And it does keep the charts organized. The problem comes in when you um, have to resolve anything from a land combat to a naval combat. You're often referring to tables that are on multiple pages. So you, with the bound charts, you end up flipping back and forth quite a bit. But the real problem is that some of these charts are actually display charts where you'll be placing uh, units. Uh, you can see here is a ground stacking chart. Now the idea is to photocopy this, which I've done, and place it off to the side, but it does, uh, it, it does get a little uh, cumbersome having to flip back and forth and try and keep the uh, tabs on the previous page you were on. So I actually prefer the, um, the loose leaf charts. Now there are, as you can see in Singapore, there are a total of 40 pages of charts. So they've got charts for just about everything and anything you can think of, including here some victory uh, condition charts. There are 36 pages of charts that come with Hakapella, and all of the charts appear to be the same. What accounts for the difference is the fact that in Singapore, there are five pages of uh, victory condition charts, whereas there are only uh, there's only one here in uh, Hakapella. Now, 
all of the, one more word on the binding here, all of the rule booklets and scenario booklets in Singapore also have this same binding. And I actually do kind of like um, spiral binding for rule books and especially for scenario books because it allows them to lay flat on the table when you need to reference them during setup or during the game. So while I'm not necessarily a big fan of the binding here of the charts, I do appreciate that they've done that with their scenario and rule books in, uh, in Singapore. So let's take a look. As you can see here, the first uh, chart we have is the order of play chart. So let's take a closer look at the sequence of play in this system. Here's a closer look at the order of play chart, which lists the sequence of play for the turn. Now, we're not going to go into great detail on this sequence of play. We will have an opportunity to dive into the various steps here in detail in some future playthrough videos. But what I wanted to do today is just give you an overview, uh, kind of a quick sense of how the turns are structured in this system. Now, each game turn, is split into two player turns. So you will have uh, an Axis player turn where they're the phasing player and the ally player is the non-phasing player. Once that's complete, it'll switch over to the allied player's player turn and he becomes the phasing player. Pretty standard stuff so far. Now, the game does use initiative. However, the Axis is always considered to uh, automatically have initiative all the way up through the first turn of October 1941 in, in any of the games in the series. And it's only from the beginning of October 41 that you will check for initiative at the very beginning of the game turn to see who gets the first uh, player turn. You will also check for weather at that point. So once weather and initiative are out of the way, we're going to have an initial phase where we do some administrative work and then get into the movement phase. Now the movement phase, first thing you're going to do is fly any airbase attack missions. After that, you're going to move any of your naval task groups. And this is the phasing player first and then the non-phasing player. So both players will be moving or having the opportunity to move their naval units in the movement phase. And then after the naval units have moved, then the phasing player only will move his ground units. You will then fly and resolve most of your air missions. That's going to lead us to the combat phase where the phasing player will declare his attacks. We will also fly and resolve any close air support and carpet bombing missions. And after the combat is resolved, we're going to uh, move on to the reaction movement phase. Now this is where the non-phasing player has the opportunity to move some of his units, uh, as long as they're eligible, up to half their movement allowance. And there are a couple of, uh, couple of prerequisites they need to meet in order to be eligible for reaction movement phase. And you'll see that uh, in some of our future videos. Following the reaction phase, we have a pursuit phase. This starts with essentially a second naval movement segment where all the naval task groups from each side will have an opportunity to move again, followed by the phasing player only being allowed to move all of his ground units again using their tactical movement rating. So if you've been keeping track, that means that your naval units will have four opportunities to move within a game turn. Two in your player turn and two in your opponent's player turn. After the pursuit phase, we come to the air return phase. Basically, any air units that are still on missions are returned to a base. And then we get to the player turn end phase, which is a, another small administrative phase. And then it's going to swap over to the other player who will run through the same order of play that you just did. So uh, there are a couple of interesting things uh, I think in this sequence of play, first you've got essentially two land movement uh, phases for the phasing player. The reaction movement phase gives the non-phasing player the opportunity to uh, uh, plug some gaps that may have been made in his lines during the combat phase. And then uh, naval forces being able to move up to four times in a single game turn uh, is interesting as well. So. That, in a nutshell, is the order of play. Now let's take a look at some of the units, and I think we'll start off looking at the land units. Before we look at the units themselves, I wanted to give you a glance at this National Color Identifiers Play Aid, which is included in every game in the series. And this is going to give you, hopefully, a little bit of an idea of the scope of the system and the detail that the system goes to. Even though this is in the Singapore game, you can see it shows the national colors for all of the 
nationalities involved in the entire system. So we got uh, German units identified here as well as other Axis miners, uh, the Soviet Union, neutral countries. And I did want to point out that something that I had not really seen too much of in strategic level games at least is that it breaks down the Commonwealth Army Air Force and Navy, not just simply as, well, okay, here's the British Army, they're a khaki, but it also differ differentiates the British Army from the South African Army, Indian Army, Australian Army, and New Zealand Army, as well as British colonial troops. And it does the same, as you can see, for the Air Forces and the Navies. Uh, it's also, uh, as you can judge by looking at the chart here, it's actually a fairly colorful game as well. And there are a few neutral nations on the back as well. You can see here some Western allied nations as well as neutral nations like Spain, Turkey, and Switzerland. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the land units. I have here a very small sample of land units that you are going to find in these games. And I'm not going to show you all of the different types of land units that are here because it is rather substantial. Uh, they've got everything from tank destroyers, assault guns, light armor, cavalry, naval infantry, fortress units, so on and so forth. What I'm mostly interested in doing right now is just getting you familiar with what the uh, various factors on the counters mean so that you can uh, hopefully follow along a little bit better with the playthroughs. We'll take up here in this top row, we have Japanese army units with their light yellow national color and black printing. You can see we've got the unit type symbol here and the unit size. This happens to be a division and the unit identifier. This is the 110th infantry division. The number to the left is uh, kind of your standard combat factor and then movement factors. Now, when you see a unit that has three factors, the leftmost factor is the attack factor. This is the defense factor in the middle and the movement on the right. This particular symbol is the symbol they're using for light infantry. So this would be the 53rd Light Infantry Division. Many of the counters, land counters in this system are double-sided. And you can see that if we flip over these divisions, you'll see they have a reduced side to them with lowered combat factors. Now, the game uses a mechanic uh, it calls stacking points. And because we have units that range all the way in size from battalions, like this cavalry battalion here, or this uh, artillery battalion, all the way up to divisions, each size unit has a differing number of stacking points. And for those of you that are familiar with the uh, Operational Combat Series, OCS, or the Europa games, the stacking point mechanic in this series functions very similarly to the regimental equivalents of those, of those other series. One other thing I did want to point out, and I don't know if we can see it here on the um, British 70th Infantry Division, but I wanted to see some units will have an anti-aircraft factor, and that's this little number. In this case, it is a two just inside the symbol box here. Hopefully that's showing up there. Uh, that indicates that this particular unit has some inherent anti-aircraft firepower that it will shoot at uh, any aircraft performing any uh, bombing missions against it. And then the red counter you see to the right of these two British counters. This is actually an Imperial Japanese naval counter. This is a coastal defense unit. And the, the bottom here just indicated it is a, it indicates it is a level two coastal defense unit. And that is used for uh, resolution of various combats uh, in its hex or against uh, naval shipping units uh, in the game. So we've got level three, level two, I think the highest I've seen is a level four so far. So those are the land units. Fairly straightforward, pretty conventional. The uh, headquarters here, this single uh, factor here is its movement factor. Uh, so if you see any units that have just one factor on them, that's going to be the movement factor. Now let's take a look at the aircraft units. Here we have another very small sample of the aircraft units that are used in the TSWW system. As you can see, we have the three Imperial Japanese Navy aircraft. We have one Japanese Army uh, bomber. We have two United States Army Air Force counters and a fleet air arm swordfish. 
First thing that jumps out at you is probably the uh, very nice um, aircraft silhouette located on each of the aircraft. Just below that you'll see the uh, type identification for the aircraft unit and then a whole lot of numbers and letters. There is quite a bit of information packed into each of the air units in this system. So let's uh, start by looking at the values in the uh, in the four corners. We'll start in the upper left here and this is the attack factor. This is going to be used in air-to-air -air combat. Moving over to the upper right here we have the air defense rating again that's going to be used primarily in air-to-air -air combat dropping down to the lower right is the range of the aircraft and then we've got uh, two numbers here in the lower left the number to the left of the dash is the operational bombing factor and the number to the right is the strategic bombing factor so you can see the b-17f here has the highest um, strategic bombing factor of 18 with the Japanese Peggy's coming in next with a 9. The letter that is in the center of the top of the counter indicates the uh, unit type. So we have A for attack aircraft, F for fighters, B for bombers, HB for heavy bombers, and HT for heavy transports. We also have night fighters, heavy fighters, dive bombers, uh, gliders. There are many different types of aircraft that this system uses and as an indication of the detail that the system goes to not only does it have the unit type up top here but then you will see oftentimes not on every counter but you'll see a letter or letters in the middle of the bottom down there and those are codes that mean various things for uh, the air units. So for instance, we have on our uh, Jill here in the upper left corner, we have a V. That indicates it is a torpedo bomber aircraft, which gives it the ability to make torpedo attacks against uh, naval ships. And to show you just how detailed we get here, we have another Jill to the right. These are basically the same aircraft type. You'll notice all of the main factors are the same except we have a V versus an AV. That A indicates that it is an ASW aircraft or it's capable of performing ASW missions. So for this particular air wing, they are either equipped and or trained in ASW warfare more so than this particular wing and they have a little greater capability. Below that, you'll see the A6M20 with a CD. The C indicates that it is a carrier aircraft and can base on aircraft carriers. And the D indicates that it has drop tanks, which allows it to avoid some range penalties in air-to-air -air fighting. You can see the swordfish down here is a VC. So we would read that as it is a torpedo uh, bomber that is carrier based. So that's a quick look at the uh, air units. I guess one last thing, the air units are all double-sided. When they are a full-sized or a full-strength air unit, they represent about 40 aircraft and are referred to as a wing. If you flip it over, this would be a half-strength or a half-sized air unit, which is referred to as a squadron in the, uh, in the system rules. And you can see that there is a general reduction in all of the values other than range, obviously, for the, uh, for the smaller uh, squadron size or half-sized air units. So as air units take losses, they take step losses. If they suffer one step loss, they will be flipped from full strength to their reduced or squadron size. If they were to take a second step loss, they would then be eliminated. So now let's take a look at the naval units. Here we have some Royal Navy and Imperial Japanese Navy ships for us to look at. And again, I think the first thing that kind of jumps out at you is the ship silhouette that is on the counter. And I don't know if it's going to show up real well on the, uh, on the camera or not, but one of the really cool things is these are not generic ship silhouettes. These are specific to that ship type, uh, not just type, but that actual ship class, I should say. So uh, the Kaga looks just like the Kaga does. The Fuso has a different 
profile from that of the Duke of York, and indeed the Fuso has a different profile from the Yamato or uh, many of the other Japanese battleships in there. And you can see that these ship counters do look close or similar to the air units. They have the same sort of factor layout. What the factors mean a little different, uh, have a little different meanings than they do for the air units as you would expect. So let's, uh, let's take a look at those. Starting in the upper left here, you have the um, naval gunnery rating, which is going to be used in surface combat and in naval gunfire support. Moving to the upper right corner, this is the protection rating, which is going to modify incoming uh, surface fire. In the lower right hand corner is the tactical speed. And then in the lower left hand corner, again, we have two numbers, just like we did with the air units. The number to the left of the dash is the anti-aircraft rating, and the number to the right of the dash is the torpedo rating. Now, similarly to aircraft, the letters in the top middle of the counter indicate the ship type. So we have CV for carrier, BB for battleship, CA for heavy cruiser, DD destroyer. Those are all uh, your fairly standard uh, naval class abbreviations. And they do make distinctions. They've got um, CVE, escort carriers, CVLs, light carriers. They have CAVs, which are your um, sort of your heavy cruiser float plane tenders. In the bottom of the counters, we also have codes similar to uh, the aircraft. And again, this is a testament to the detail of the system. Uh, you can see here, let's look first at the carrier. You see not letters, but a number, a number three. That is the uh, capacity of the carrier. So what that three indicates is that the Kaga can carry three squadron sized air units. So those would be the half size air units uh, at its maximum capacity. Looking at the battleship here, Fuso, we have an F and an R. The F indicates that it uh, has a float plane, which gives it a certain capability, and R indicates that it has uh, radar, which will give it a uh, die roll modifier in uh, certain cases. You can see we also have the uh, R code for both of the British ships indicating they have radar. The M code here on the uh, Hokaze Japanese destroyer indicates that it is a mine layer or has the capability to lay mines. You can see we also have a submarine flotilla. Many of the small uh, torpedo boats and gunboats are also represented as flotillas and you can tell that the unit is a flotilla because right after the uh, unit type code you will see F for flotilla. And then lastly here at the bottom we have an NSP which is a naval shipping point. This uh, represents the merchant shipping um, and again it has the same values or the same factors that any of your surface combat ships do and the capacity. In this case the three indicates that this naval shipping point counter can carry up to three stacking points worth of units. That's pretty much it for the uh, for the naval units uh, and really for all the units we're going to look at uh, today. Uh, next up we will get into the first of the discovery scenarios and I think that's going to focus on the uh, naval combat system in, uh, in TSWW. So looking forward to that. Hopefully you enjoyed today. It was a bit informative for you. I appreciate you watching. Take care and we'll see you next time.